In the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Do be seated. Always a pleasure to come to St. Barnabas. This is my second time, I think, in the uh, pandemic, whatever it is, 13 months or 14 months. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your invitation <clears throat> and always a joy to enjoy the music in this town. Thank you, Michael. The singers at Psalm was uh, exquisite. And I spend a lot of time at St. Thomas, so that's, a <laughs> that's quite a compliment. Well, today we continue to uh, revel in the joy and the peace of Eastertide and that Easter proclamation we heard at the beginning, Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed, Alleluia. And the three New Testament readings, and uh, in the season of Easter all the readings come from the New Testament, in a sense fill out uh, the Easter truth, if you like. Um, that first reading from... Uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch is a familiar one and it tells of the, the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ in the early church. It was um, a reading that seemed to appear in my Sunday school curriculum with monotonous regularity. I suppose it was suitably exotic and easily to illustrate for kids anyhow. I, uh, it's sort of embedded in my psyche somewhere. The John reading from his first epistle contains some of the most cherished words in the scripture. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. And the Gospel of John contains another of what we call the I am sayings of uh, Jesus. Remember last week we had I am the good shepherd, uh, and today I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. I am the vine and you are the branches. And the vine image connotes a, a sense of the intimacy of our relationship with God, between God and us, as well as being a model for Christian uh, community. But today I want to focus on that remarkable passage from the Acts of the Apostles, which is a sort of a metaphor for the Christian life, which of course is the um, resurrection life. The life we live by being grafted into Christ through our baptism. Now Philip, as you'll remember, was one of those along with Stephen and others chosen as deacons by the apostles in the early days to assist in the ministry of service while the apostles got on with the, the real ministry. Sometimes we go on about it. Um, and Stephen, as we remember, met a sticky end by stoning, but was able to mirror the dying Christ by forgiving his enemies. His death was witnessed by Saul, who after his conversion, later in the narrative, became the great missionary Paul. And after the death of Stephen, the persecution associated with it, we hear about Philip going to Samaria and becoming not just a a servant, but a, an evangelist preaching the risen Christ. And today's uh, Acts reading follows on with Philip being commanded by the angel to go south to the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. I love the, the language, get up and go. Get up and go. Um, words directed at Abraham, Moses, and others throughout um, salvation history. Not a bad message for the church today as we've sort of laboured through the pandemic and it has been hard work I think all around. We've missed so much in regular community and all the things we take for granted in the church and the sense there's a, a, a sense of pause I feel uh, around churches at present as tentatively we start to open up. But it's good to hear that get up and go and at some point we, I think we have to take the risk as church and literally get up and go and get on with the gospel, uh, get back into our full vigour. Um, I keep hearing about a, a lot of talk about the new normal, that sort of thing. Well, whatever that means, there are certain things we need to get up and 
and do, uh, preach the gospel, gather in worship, say our prayers, do our outreach and our service to the community, and all those things that are part and parcel of the spiritual life. So just don't forget those words. Get up and go, Philip. Get up and go. Don't just uh, sit around having a good time. And it's here he encounters the Ethiopian eunuch, who strangely is never actually named. We hear a lot of details about him. Um, but just before I go into the details about the Ethiopian eunuch, if in your mind you're hearing another passage of scripture, you're probably spot on. Because if you remember, um, it's now generally accepted that Luke of the Gospel fame also wrote the Acts of the Apostles, if you like. Luke is part one and Acts is part two. Luke is the story of Jesus. Acts is the story of the early church. Uh, Luke is focused on the journey to Jerusalem, which climaxes in the, in the death of Jesus, his resurrection. Whereas uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, it begins in Jerusalem and goes out to the known world um, in the missionary journeys, of, particularly of Paul. So there's a sort of a shape there in the, in the two books uh, of the New Testament and it's agreed that uh, Luke wrote both. And what is interesting is there, is there is some parallels and the parallel to the Ethiopian eunuch of course is the walk to Emmaus, resurrection passage we heard a few Sundays ago. Um, the same sort of sense of journey uh, in encounters in the way, uh, on the way, if you like. Um, in one, the encounter between the risen Lord who's not recognised and the two disciples, and the other between the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. And in both cases, the, the stranger, uh, or the other, opens up the scriptures to the inquirer. Um, and one finishes with the breaking of bread and the revelation of the risen Christ at Emmaus, and the other finishes with the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. And so there's a sort of a parallel there, both of them about journeys, and, and both of them, in a sense, can be seen as models of the spiritual life, of walking the way of faith, or the journey of faith, I like that term, a journey which we're all on, begun with our baptism, but all of us are journeyers. Um, if you think you've arrived, I think you're anticipating things a bit. <laughs> the arrival's on the other side, I suspect, when we are face to face with our Lord and Saviour. All of us are journeyers. We're all pilgrims of faith. Anyhow, we're told about this exotic figure, the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, He's obviously an important person in his own country, he's the head of the treasury. It's thought that what is described as Ethiopia probably refers to more likely what we call the Sudan. He'd be a person of fairly dark skin. And he'd come to the, oh, well he was certainly a eunuch, we weren't told much about eunuchs in Sunday school, um, I'll, I'll leave it to your imagination, but there were a class of males who were particularly uh, dealt with in order that they could be uh, security guards really in the royal household and not threaten the integrity of the royal family. If you get my meaning. They were safe, safe people to have around in a royal household when people were very touchy about the, who did what and who didn't do what. And so he was a, a particular class of person but we also learned that he was a God-fearing Gentile. He'd been up to Jerusalem to worship. Um, he must have been a courageous man because actually he wasn't allowed in the temple. He wasn't allowed to enter because he was A, a foreigner, and B, he was a eunuch and regarded as unclean. 
So he'd been to worship, I guess, standing at the entrance to the temple or outside somewhere. So he must have been a very faithful man to keep at it, even though he wasn't allowed in. On both counts, he was uh, very much a marginalised person. And in this encounter, he's affirmed uh, by being baptised into the risen Christ. His acceptance into the new Christian community is consistent with a very important theme in Luke's Gospel. Now you'll be familiar that Luke particularly tells stories about outsiders, best known as the Good Samaritan. And uh, others, his encounters with women, with the Roman centurion, there, there are several stories that Luke emphasises Jesus' ministry, the way he broke down traditional barriers between people and opened the gospel to them. And I like to think that Luke very much highlights the inclusive ministry of Jesus, that the good news proclaimed by Jesus is for all people everywhere. Now we say in the Creed in a few moments, the Gospel of Jesus is truly universal and Catholic, meaning embracing all people at all times and in all places. It's that inclusive. All people matter to God. And so he is this marginalised person, this exotic person, the Ethiopian eunuch who's welcomed in to the early Christian community. And then we read about the encounter between Philip and the, the eunuch. Philip hears him reading aloud in his chariot or conveyance. Now the ancients, when they read, read aloud. Some of you may do that practice. It's, it's actually particularly like you're reading poetry or scripture, it's very good to read it even by yourself. I mean, you, your spouse might come knocking at the door and saying, you all right, dear? <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a very good practice because you not only see the words, but you hear them as well. And so the Ethiopian eunuch was reading, in fact, reading Isaiah 53. And the Ethiopian asks Philip for guidance. And he, he invites Philip to join him. I find that very profound, that Philip sits with him as a fellow journeyer. He doesn't impose himself on the Ethiopian eunuch. He actually awaits his invitation. It's the Ethiopian who asks the first question. Can you help me understand this scripture? If you like, there is a, a mutuality in the engagement between the two of them. Now, I think that's very important to note when we think about at the mission of the church, how we proclaim the gospel. I think uh, it's true to say we're not in the business of shoving the gospel down people's throats. Now, I think uh, in history that's uh, sometimes been otherwise. The church has said, well, we, we are right, we've got the truth, you better believe it or else. Um, that's not the way of Jesus. And what we see here is a wonderful mutuality, uh, res responding to people's <coughs> questions and needs inviting people into the exploration of uh, it which is inherent in the journey of faith. And then we are told Philip began to speak and starting with this scripture he proclaimed to them the good news about Jesus. Now that mirrors the passage I was referring to in Luke with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You remember them beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them the things about himself in scriptures. Um, it must have been a long Bible study. But nevertheless, um, 
It's important for us to note the scriptures, of course, were the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, because the New Testament wasn't in existence. And for the early church, the searching of the, the Hebrew scriptures was so important to find references that made sense of their experience of Jesus Christ, and particularly his death and resurrection. And it just so happens that Isaiah 53 and the whole um, image of the suffering servant became tremendously important to the early church, understanding the sort of messianic quality of Jesus and his death, which was central uh, to the, the, the image of the, the suffering servant. And you'll remember the disciples on the Emmaus Road when, when they eventually, Jesus broke the bread and, and, and they recognised him. It was then they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he was talking to us in the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? It was as they recognised the risen Christ, they recognised that he was with them in the opening of warm. And I think Sunday by Sunday as we hear the scriptures read, not all the time, but sometimes, it sets off your heart and soul. Your heart is warm by something. I mean, just hearing that second lesson today about God is love, I mean, is a sort of an extraordinary beauty there. And I always say, yes, yes, of course God is love and that we ought to love each other. Um, as wonderful as it is, it's not always easy work, <laughs> as we know. Uh, loving one another can be, can be tested by all sorts of things uh, in this life. And then, of course, the Ethiopian unit takes the ultimate initiative. Look, here is water. What is there to prevent me being baptised? I've taken that, that uh, request to heart uh, through my ministry. And this last year I celebrated 50 years of ordained ministry. Made me feel like a bit ancient. But still, one of the things that are, perhaps one of the most challenging things in ministry often is the people who come for baptism. And I've always said in my mind, the Ethiopian eunuch, he asked for baptism. And Philip responded. And sometimes when people come for baptism, children, you know, infants are brought, or adults, or particularly with infant baptisms, sometimes in the back of my mind I think, I wonder why they've come. <clears throat> Was it mother-in-law or grandma or are they sort of doing the right thing and uh, then I sort of say to myself well that may be but also God may be at work with these people the spirit of God perhaps hardly recognised is at work with them as they come seeking baptism and I particularly think in the 21st century when we're becoming a much more secular society, whoever comes, give thanks. The fact that they even come, uh, welcome them. It's a time for acceptance and welcome, but also a time to catechise, to teach the faith, to open up the faith to them. Wonderful opportunity. Look, here is water. What is prevent me being baptised. And again, I say, it's the eunuch who takes the initiative. And Emmaus climaxes in a Eucharistic-like moment and breaking of bread. Philip's encounter finds its, its um, climax in the baptism of the eunuch in water beside the road. I often think <clears throat> when it comes to baptism and particularly with infant baptism 
we take a lot on, um, we sort of take a risk. But I've also always said to myself, who knows what seeds are planted in the child, in the parents, in the grandparents, in the godparents, by our ministry, what seeds are sown and who knows when they'll come to fruition. And I've known people who've come to faith late in age and they've said, we were baptised as infants. It's only now um, I suddenly realise what it means, what faith means to me. And I've often seen that as <coughs> a very slow-growing seed. A seed that was planted long ago suddenly in the right uh, climate, the right temperature, the right watering, whatever, comes to life lying dormant all those years. And so um, that ministry of baptism, which sometimes can come burdensome, sometimes to the priest, sometimes to the congregation. I remember my last parish in New York City, people complained we had too many baptisms. And I'd say, well, give thanks. <laughs> that's the future of the church. Don't complain. And that's, what, that's the business we're in. And the eunuch, having been baptised, he goes on his way rejoicing. Don't miss that passage. He goes on his way rejoicing. Ultimately, the journey of faith leads to joy. Joy to, of knowing that we are loved by God, accepted by God, wanted by God, that we are God's, and we belong to the community of faith. And for that Ethiopian eunuch, that must have been a profound experience. But we hear no more of the eunuch. We don't hear whether he was confirmed or whether he went to church or whatever he did. We don't hear anything more about him. And we hear hardly anything more about Philip. Uh, we're told in the next verse he goes off to Samaria or somewhere. Uh, and then he disappears from the book. Uh, and there are a lot of untold stories. And I often wonder if you could perhaps write a novel about Philip or the eunuch, what happened to him any of your writers who might take up that challenge. <laughs> but this encounter remains for us a model of mission and evangelism for proclaiming the gospel with, with uh, respect and sensitivity, for sharing the scriptures when the opportunity presents itself, and for not being shy to share the good news of Jesus and of the joy and the peace and the sense of abundant life that it gives us. So, Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.